Well, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome you to the AES Melbourne section meeting and the presentation for February 2022. My name is Graham Huon and I'm the chair here. Tonight, we're very privileged to have a presentation by Merlin Van Veen. After studying studio recording and jazz piano at the Royal Concert Conservatoire in The Hague, Merlin started his career at the Dutch Broadcast Company, performing sound engineering for TV shows such as Big Brother. He also worked at the Harlequin Holland, mixing more than 150 live performances going throughout Europe and internationally before starting his own education program, sharing his and others' knowledge and experience. Merlin has had extensive experience in hands-on audio production for recording and television in Holland, in technical education, in the production of design tools, including for subwoofer array design. Merlin has also been principal teacher for sound reinforcement at the Royal Conservatoire at both under and postgraduate levels. Merlin is also moderator of the test and measurement board of the ProSound Web Lab Forums and provided input to the third edition of the book, Sound Systems Design and Optimization by Mayor Sounds' Bob McCarthy. Merlin also publishes regularly in Live Sound International magazine. Merlin's based in Germany. He joined Mayor Sounds' global education leadership team in 2018 hosting educational webinars and roundtable discussions, as well as finding time for design work. In all, a very impressive resume. Tonight, Merlin is presenting on developing performance ratings for professional sound system loudspeakers and drivers, and in particular, the challenge of measuring loudspeaker maximum linear, linear sound levels. This raises key questions such as just what is the test signal that best represents the working life of a loudspeaker and just how do you accurately estimate this in a manufacturing environment? This work is embodied in draft AES standard 75, which Merlin moderated with the AES draft for comment status and it's just been released about two weeks ago, I think. We're indebted to Merlin for braving the Southern time zones and generously sharing his knowledge, experiences and valuable time. As with all Zoom sessions, please keep your microphone muted unless invited to speak or for the usual welcome and thank you. The chat facility in Zoom at the bottom of your screen can be used for you to raise questions and that way we'll make sure we answer them and we can do it at the appropriate time. So I'd like you all to unmute so you find the button and I give, give Merlin a warm welcome and thank you in anticipation of what will be an interesting show. Over to you, Merlin. Thank you very much, uh, Graeme. Um, so yes, welcome uh, to today's presentation. Um, I would like to thank the AES section in Australia for um, having us. Um, although I work at Myers Sound, today I will be wearing first and foremost my um, AES hat as chair of the, the work group that Graeme mentioned um, before. And um, as far as I'm concerned, it can be a dialogue, which means that if I'm not expressing myself clearly or you would like to repeat myself, um, just let me know. If you have any questions, I am not a, I'm not a, uh, uh, it, it doesn't affect my performance if you interject and ask questions or, and, and, and whatnot. Um, you, you can use the chat, I will monitor that as well. Um, so. Um, yeah, whenever there's confusion or I, I need to clear up something, uh, don't be a stranger. Uh, I expect this to last about an hour. Um, I have um, a bunch of slides and, and if time allows, uh, some listening examples. And um, why, why don't we start with a, with a background, um, background story first. So um, there's, there's basically, um, when it comes to the work that we did within the AES, there's, there's two people involved. Um, there's myself, um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm the chair of this work group, but um, none of it would have been possible without, um, without my co-chair, um, which is um, Roger Schwenke. Um, so between the two of us, um, we were um, chaperoning this uh, work group. Um, it's SEO 403A, and uh, we were uh, commissioned to um, come up with a standard um, for determining maximum linear sound levels uh, of products that are ready to go to market 
using uh, noise. And uh, there, there are several key people that I would like to acknowledge that have been uh, very important to this endeavor in the past two years, starting with Bruce Olson, uh, as you well know, President-elect and Standard Chair, but also Richard Hutt, uh, um, sorry, Richard Hutt, Richard Cabot, uh, which is chair of the, the work group that we report to, um, and then Steve Hutt, the other way around. Steve Hutt is the chair of the work group that we report to, and Richard Cabot is the standards management manager that um, takes care of many of the uh, administrative and clerical aspects of developing a standard. And then um, the task group itself had over 70 members, and these people came from all verticals, from automotive to consumer electronics, uh, post-production facilities, uh, cinema, uh, life sound reinforcement. So it was great to see so many uh, different verticals being represented within the task group. And it never ceases to amaze me that these people uh, volunteered to meet every two weeks during an unprecedented pandemic. And in the past two years, we, uh, we have been meeting over 50 times and we're tantalizing close, really tantalizing close to um, having the standard being um, published. And it's, uh, it's been, a, uh, they're all troopers and it's, um, it's been a, a, a super uh, impressive uh, team effort. I also feel compelled to thank the founders of Meyer Sound, um, where M-Noise um, uh, was developed uh, before it migrated to the AES. Um, John and Helen Meyer are our founders. So I'm going to give you a little uh, of a timeline. This story began in 2018, when Meyer Sound started publishing uh, the so-called M-Noise videos at the dedicated M-Noise website at the time um, to, um, to um, start a dialogue about measuring sound levels under linear conditions. Uh, John himself spoke about that when he received the AES, um, when he was honored to do the AES Heiser Memorial Lecture in 2018. Not much later in January 2019, M-Noise website was launched because it was clear to the company that if we expect the industry at large to adopt this new idea, then uh, a certain amount of distance between Meyer Sound and its baby is, is required. Um, so M-Noise from the very beginning has been living on its own dedicated website um, in an attempt to sever that umbilical cord uh, to, to Meyer Sound. And then in April 2019, uh, there was the Soundcheck um, Expo trade show in Mexico, which was also attended to Bruce Ol by Bruce Olson who was uh, also presented there. And this is where, um, at the time with Pablo Espinoza, um, we started first conversations about um, whether this uh, signal and its companion procedure would serve the industry at large. And it was Bruce Olson basically that said, yes, we should start a drafting group, uh, uh, a task force that starts uh, looking at the work done by Meyer Sound and, and adopt it and, and uh, turn it into a official AS uh, standard. And that's what we've been doing uh, for the past two years. And in the process, we have uh, published several papers um, that I will show you later, one for the an engineering brief, a SEMTI paper, and one for the Institute of Acoustics, um, just as, as collateral to, um, to, to underscore uh, the claims that are, are being made in the standard. Because as we all know that, you know, that you, you're never concerned in this example, you're never concerned about finding a suitable light bulb that mates well to a lighting fixture. You don't worry whether it blows up or whether, you know, you, you, you need to call a fireman to extinguish the fire. Uh, we don't worry about that. Um, if the sticker on the lighting fixture says, you know, a 60 watt bulb at most, you get a 60 watt bulb and you don't waste any energy um, other than the 60 watts, but you don't waste any energy on um, worrying about whether that will work or not. Nor do you worry about what happens if you flip the switch. You have no concerns, not consciously, not subconsciously, no concerns about what happens if you flip the switch. And the same goes for the, for the, the potentiometer, the dimmer knob. You can crank it up all the way to 11, so to speak, and you do not worry whether that will damage the lighting bulb or will cause a fire or, 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 or other nasty uh, events. Um, 
Unfortunately, we also know from personal experience that that is not true for a similar knob on your AV receiver within the confinements of your living room. Depending on which radio station you might be dialed in, uh, you may be concerned about whether you can turn it all the way up or not. If you're, you're listening to classical music, there might be some subconscious concern and you might you know, only turn it up halfway, where if, is your, if you're listening to contemporary rock music, you might feel comfortable uh, turning it up a little bit further. And I think that's something that you can all relate to. It's, it's not as uh, clear cut as it is with light bulbs and, and light fixtures. So the impetus for, for this project is basically that we wanted to come up with uh, a procedure that allows you to determine the maximum linear SPL capabilities of a, a transducer or a loudspeaker that is ready to go to market uh, with the same ease as you would go about determining its weight. Because the thing with weight is that nobody cares to validate it or double check it because it's so easy to call out when it's been not determined properly. So whenever you ask people, how do you find the weight of a loudspeaker, they simply look it up in the, in the specification sheet or in the operating manual. And they don't second guess that number because surely uh, any re respectable manufacturer can accurately determine the weight of a loudspeaker. And... Um, but the thing is that those same, you know, that same collateral, uh, that published collateral, operating manuals and instructions and whatnot, also typically contain uh, performance metrics regarding the um, SPL capabilities of such a device. And more often than not, those numbers are being treated with the same lack of scrutiny as the weight of a loudspeaker. But there's one big caveat, which is that typically the stop conditions that let a manufacturer to decide this is where the buck stops until here and no further, the stop conditions are typically not disclosed. And that means that an audio professional with access to the same gear, unlike the weight of a loudspeaker, cannot replicate those findings because of the unknown stop conditions and the unknown measurement conditions. And you may feel or agree with us that there's room for improvement. So. That is basically the impetus for this standard. Can we come up with standardized stop conditions such that an audio professional with access to the same gear can replicate and validate those findings and uh, possibly call out a manufacturer for um, coming up with numbers that are subject to debate? So that's, that's the spirit. Now, as you're well aware, and again, I, I have no intention of uh, offending your intelligence during the course of this presentation. So pardon, uh, I, I pardon ahead of time if I, if I sometime linger on things which may be mundane or possibly even pedestrian. But historically, we've been using pink noise, but I think we can all agree that pink noise is not music, as the band spectra on the screen um, right now um, clearly point out. So maybe you should use music as the source. Sure, if you can agree on which song to use, uh, and that will be very unlikely. And the other challenge with music is that in music, not all the notes are played at the same time, unlike uh, for noise signals. So while we want to rate our loudspeakers for the expected program content, such as music, um, using music itself may be um, ill-advised. The other thing that is very important is Crest Factor. And I just want to show you this, although everybody is readily aware of this. Um, I just want to take a minute to show this nevertheless, uh, not to insult your intelligence, but um, to show you how we loosely define, um, loosely define um, crest factor. So here we have a, a, a drum hit, a snare drum, and as you're well aware, how hard, it, how hard we hit the snare drum will determine the peak level, um, but um, there's also an average shown to the, to the left that is a, a, an integrated level over a, a one second time period. And of course, everybody knows that the, the peak to average ratio is, is what we, we call crest factor. Now, if we hit our drum more often, provided we do it with the same intensity, um, with the same vigor, then we do not expect the, the peak level to rise uh, as long as we hit it with the same intensity. But um, what you will discover is that when you start to hit the drum more often, if you increase the number of repetitions, then your our mass level will rise. And as such, um, 
loosely defined, we like to say crest factor is the difference between how hard you hit the drum and how often you hit the drum. And um, so it has to do with density, with sparseness. And actual music might have certain events, such as percussion and whatnot, that is sparse and is expected to be high crest factor. And there may be sustained event, continuous events, um, where there's no downtime between consecutive notes being plucked or uh, keystrokes and whatnot. And those typically tend to be low crest factor. Um, so what does that mean for music? Well, if we, if we low pass music and we look at the crest factor, then we get a value that you would expect to see, uh, you know, that is similar in the same ballpark as for pink noise. So if I hit play um, and we low pass this track, then we see a crest factor, which is in order of 12 to B, give or take. But if we high pass the music, suddenly we hear all those transients these are sparse signals and the crest factor rises uh, significantly. But is this also true for pink noise, of course, remains to be seen. So I'm gonna um, stop the presentation for now. And I wanna dive a little bit further into that um, by, by starting to look at pink noise first. So I've got several music files here, which are royalty free, um, no concern. And uh, the first track is uh, Pink Noise. And of course, the broadband crest factor of Pink Noise is 12 dB, as is shown in the bottom right corner. But now I want to take it one step up. Now I'm going to single out a single octave out of the roughly uh, 10 audible octaves that you and I can hear. And for those that are listening um, through their computer loudspeakers, I will start at 250 Hertz. So I just threw away nine out of 10 octaves, and I'm interested in finding out what the crest factor is for that remaining octave. And as you will see, is uh, the crest factor for this one out of 10 octaves is about 11 to 12 decibels, very much similar to the broadband crest factor, all frequencies included. If we go to a different octave, let's say one kilohertz, Again, singling out one out of 10 octaves, the crest factor remains very close to the broadband cache crest factor um, expected of, of pink noise. Um, if we go up by another octave or two to four kilohertz, again, there's little or no change in the crest factor for pink noise. So pink noise is an incredibly robust signal. You can literally tear it apart and its crest factor will remain functionally unaffected. Whether this is also true for music, of course, is to be determined. So let's go to a classical piece of music and let's look at the broadband crest factor first. So that's about 13 to 15 decibels. That still speaks in favor of pink noise um, as, a, as a substitute for, for actual program content. But what happens now if we start to single out, again, one octave um, starting at 250 hertz? Well, this is, this is continuous. This is not sparse. There's no downtime between consecutive events. So we see the same value as you would expect to see um, for pink noise. But if we go up in frequency, one kilohertz, now this is still continuous, but it's becoming more transient, more sparse, if you will, but still values that are similar order of magnitude as what we saw with pink noise. And it shall not come as a surprise that if we go up in frequency, now we start to hear the tambourines and whatnot. This is now becoming sparse. This is becoming transient. And as such, the crest factor is now starting to rise um, with increasing frequency. And we can uh, go up to the next octave if we want, eight kilohertz. And suddenly we start to see values for the crest factor, which are significantly higher uh, than what we saw for frequencies below one kilohertz. And you can hear all those transients, the metal, and whatnot with the downtime in between. Um, 
we've done this not in this way. This is what I call the poor man's version of the analysis, but we've done this for hundreds of tracks uh, of every possible genre you and I can think of, including uh, pre-produced music, as well as board mixes captured during live performances and also cinema, uh, cinema soundtracks. So we really try to look at a very big ver variety of, of possible program content. And without exception, without exception, you will see that with increasing frequency, unlike for pink noise, the crest factor starts to rise as a function of frequency. So the challenge became to come up with a test signal that not only has the spectral composition you would expect of music, but also has this defining attribute, which is a crest factor that rises with frequency, something that pink noise does not do. And we would like it to be dense because, as I said before, in music, not all the notes are played at the same time. So um, that ended up becoming M noise, where M stands for music, as in music noise. These findings were uh, published by Roger in a Senti paper 2019, where he showed uh, the results of the analysis. And um, you can watch that video um, if you desire to do so. Um, you will notice that I make use of these QR codes. If you uh, take a photo of those with your smartphone, uh, that should take you directly uh, to that YouTube video. Now, there are many signals out there that um, intended, are, are developed to be what is known as simulated program content. And while the amount of low frequency content is contested, all of these simulated program content signals agree on one thing, that is that sooner or later, the RMS level of music, of program content, rolls off with increasing frequency, which we can also see by looking at the band spectrum to the right. But whether these signals also have the dynamic properties you would expect of music, that remains to be seen. So here we have uh, three signals. We're looking at the RMS level, mind you, the average level. And we have pink noise, which obviously is equal power per octave and shows up as a flat line. And then we have another simulated program content, which is the, the CA or CTA uh, 426B. Uh, which is high passed, and then there's there's a roll off, and then shown in blue is the RMS level of M noise. So, like we saw before, you know these two simulated program contents, apart from ping noise, are in good agreement and agree that sooner or later the the RMS level rolls off with increasing frequency. But what about the peak levels as a function per octave? of the signals. Well, that brings us to the next picture. And of course, everybody gained market share. The pink noise has a 12 dB crest factor for all frequencies included, as well as per octave for reasons that we discussed earlier. So the, the, the pink trace, which is the, the peak values of pink noise per octave, went up by 12 decibels. And if you do the analysis for signals such as 426B, you will discover that it's essentially, it's effectively filtered, it's effectively filtered pink noise. So the crest factor as a function of frequency remains the same as what you would expect of pink noise. However, if we now look at the peak values for M noise, then you will see that the peak values for M noise when not, did not go up by 12 dB for each octave. They went up for 12 dB for the octaves below 500 Hz, but the peak values went up by more than 12 dB um, for frequencies above 500 Hz. So we like to think of it, of this signal, as the best of both worlds. It has the RMS attributes you would expect of um, program content, of music, but it has the peak attributes you would expect of pink noise, which is valid because that's also the behavior that you observe when you perform the analysis for actual music. And subsequently, if we now plot the peak to average ratio, which everybody calls crest factor, then we see that below 500 Hertz, these three signals are identical, including M noise. M noise will not reveal new information for subwoofers because it's functionally the same below 500 Hertz. However, what sets M noise apart of the other simulated program content is that starting at 500 Hertz, the crest factor started to rise with increasing frequency, 
which is something that those other two signals do not um, feature that, that property. Um, so it's not the peaks that gain market share with infre increasing frequency, it's the RMS level that rolls off with increasing frequency, and as a result, the difference between the two rises. Uh, this is more of an illustration. This actually shows you a subset of all the data that was analyzed, but if you just squint your eyes and look through your eyelashes, you're going to see the same progression, which is that for music, the peaks as a function of frequency per octave, the peaks are effectively flat. It's the RMS level that rolls off, rolls off with increasing frequency, and as a result, the crest factor rises with increasing frequency frequency, something that Pink Noise or 426B or any of those other simulated program content, which is effectively filtered Pink Noise, a, a property that they do not possess. Um, so that with respect to the analysis. And um, you may wonder how it sounds. Well, here we go. I'm going to play this. Oops. And this is what it sounds like. So it basically sounds like pink noise being mashed up with impulses. And it's those impulses that cause the crest factor to rise with increasing frequency. Now, I've been asked to occasionally stop presenting um, um, by, um, by Rodney so uh, people can look at my face. So before we move on, uh, I would briefly want to offer you the opportunity to ask any questions or um, or uh, resolve any um, unclarities. Thank you. Thank you for stopping. It's Rodney. Um, how do you generate the M noise? Is it an algorithm? In so the, the, there, is a, there is a patent that describes how the signal is being generated. Um, and I'm happy to um, share a link to the patent uh, in offline communication. Um, but there is a there is a document that describes in great detail how the signal is generated. Thank you. Any other questions at this stage? Okay. Well, with that, um, please allow me to continue um, by um, talking about the next paper that was presented. This is not in chronological order, but it matters for. Um, it matters for the um, the standard itself because uh, another big uh, ingredient in the standard is coherence. Um, coherence will be used as an indicator of distortion. Now, not as a replacement for determining distortion because there are superior ways to do that, as you're well aware, uh, whether that's uh, THD or IMD or, or any of those, um, but to use coherence as an indicator of distortion which can be done under very uh, specific conditions. Uh, there cannot be contamination of the measurement. There cannot be uncorrelated noise. There cannot be, uh, there, there are some rules of engagement, and I will um, show you those one at a time. So here we see a um, transfer function analyzer, which happens to be SIM. Coherence is shown on the right-hand side, going from 0 to 100% where 100% can be loosely defined as all signal, no contamination, and 0% would be exclusively contamination, no signal. So what happens if somebody disrupts the measurement by turning on a noise source such as a vacuum cleaner? So, what you saw happening is that the moment that the noise source was turned on, coherence started to cave, informing you that you have contamination of the measurement. It's also important that um, you can detect such disruptions not only for uh, sustained sounds like the vacuum cleaner, but also for transient events. And this is what we lovingly call the hammer and anvil test. So watch what happens whenever the hammer meets the anvil.
So without exception, whenever the anvil is hit by the hammer, we see coherence sag. It doesn't happen in real time because there's lag due to the number crunching, but 10 out of 10 times, whenever there is an uncorrelated disruption, coherence will reflect that. And we call that a real-time analyzer. Doesn't happen in real time, also not to be mistaken for real-time analyzer such as an RTA, like a Clark Technic DN360 or something, but we call it a real-time analyzer where all audio samples are being processed. Not necessarily in real time, but um, all audio samples are being processed. No samples slip between the cracks of consecutive uh, measurement frames. And we need that, we need that responsiveness because the, the M-noise test signal contains these uh, sparse transients that may or may not trigger uh, distortion. And if that happens to be the case, we want to catch those uh, offending events. So we need our analyzers to be capable of capturing those very short transient uh, disruptions. The other thing that can cause loss of coherence is interaction with the room. If you were to measure this loudspeaker at a very large distance, relatively speaking, um, then, as I like to say, the room creeps into your measurement. Um, you've got late arriving energy and whatnot, and that makes coherence drop. However, if you close the air gap, if you reduce the distance, uh, then the direct sound will start to dominate over everything else, and you see coherence increase proportionally. Because what we're trying to achieve is a situation where we can say with confidence that if there is loss of coherence, that the only known, core, only known cause is distortion. That's what we effectively want to achieve, a situation where we can say with confidence the only known source for coherence loss is distortion. And that means that when we do these measurements, you need to have ample signal-to-noise ratio and you need to have a high direct to reverberant ratio. And that's why the transfer function microphone typically ends up very close to the loudspeaker such that we can say with confidence, hey, there is a loss of coherence. It must have been caused by distortion. Which kind of distortion, what flavor, that's beyond the scope of this uh, standard. It's an indicator. It would be up to the people that are testing the, the system under, under test to then start looking into what causes the distortion. Um, so it's an indicator. It's not, it's not going to tell you specifically what causes the, uh, the distortion. And um, there is a variable in the procedure that we call the playback level, level, which is basically the level of the excitation signal. And you can play with the level of the excitation signal, and it will tell you what the cause for coherence losses that you may or may not be dealing with. Because imagine that you have uh, a stable level of background noise. Well, if your background level, uh, your background noise level is, is somewhat uh, constant over time, and you were to increase the excitation level by raising the playback level, you would expect coherence to rise. If that happens to, to be the case, you can rule out, you can eliminate background noise because you can improve your coherence by raising the level of the excitation signal. And that is how you can empirically determine whether you are dealing with background noise as a possible cause for coherence loss. Um, if it's interaction with the room, then you would expect the coherence to be the same independent of the playback level because it's cause and effect. If you energize the room more, it's going to throw more back at you, um, but the ratio is the same, so you would expect coherence to remain constant. Whereas if you start to raise your playback level and you see the coherence drop, then that's an indicator that is telling you that you have distortion energy creeping into your measurement, making the coherence drop. And this is what was discussed in the paper that was presented at the Institute of Acoustic. So with playing, by playing with that level of the excitation signal, you can very easily rule out the potential causes for coherence loss. And we want to keep only one cause and one cause alone, which is distortion. So we need to have sufficient signal to noise and be close enough such that we have uh, a high direct to reverberant uh, ratio. And then finally, 
how does coherence relate to distortion? Well, this is what um, was presented in the engineering brief uh, that was uh, published in 2019, because in the absence of noise and reverberation and whatnot, or if distortion is the only known cause for coherence loss, uh, you can actually draw some um, connections between, for example, harmonic distortion and loss of coherence. Because the problem with uh, a real-time analyzer, as we're about to see, is that a real-time analyzer, such as the moving LEDs on the Clark Technic, will not show you whether there's distortion or not. And coherence is something that we can exploit. We get it for free because it's determined from quantities already produced in the course of calculating a transfer function. So we can use that to our advantage. Um, depending on which textbook you pick up, um, coherence might be um, denoted as gamma squared, or it might be denoted as gamma. Um, that's just, just a conversion, and the, the standard has an uh, informative annex that speaks about that. But here we see a, a, a loudspeaker that's being measured, and we see a band spectrum, and if we introduce as much as 50% harmonic distortion, there will be no significant change in the band spectrum. So single-ended FFT, as it's also known, does not allow you to detect distortion. Whereas if you resort to dual channel FFT or transfer function analysis and you introduce distortion, then you will see coherence drop if it's the only known cause for coherence loss. So in the video that's about to follow, I have a little black box that allows me to introduce as much as 100% harmonic distortion. And when I do that, invariably coherence starts to drop. So here we see the box, that's the potentiometer and I can introduce as much as 100% harmonic distortion. Okay, so there you have it. Every time we increase the distortion, without exception, you see coherence drop. And that means that if we were to put that in a uh, picture, then you can do, again, loosely defined, you can draw, you know, using M noise as the source, you will see the following progression. And that tells you that once your coherence drops below uh, 91%, give or take, that uh, you're already looking potentially at uh, harmonic distortion, apologies, you're already looking at harmonic distortion in excess of uh, 15%, which is by no means uh, trivial. Whereas if you have coherence loss of, um, sorry, trigger finger, if you have coherence loss of uh, less than 10% um, due to distortion, then you're looking, about, you're looking at about 5 to 10% harmonic distortion. So that's again a nice place to do a, a, a quick pause um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so don't get me wrong, we do not propose coherence as a replacement for all the other techniques which are evidently superior. It's just an indicator of distortion. Remember, we're trying to do something which is as easy as determining the weight of a loudspeaker um, without being, you know, having to have several PhDs. Uh, any questions at this point? Yeah, well, Rodney, again, it seems to be uh, a very quick and easy way of um, indicating whether distortion is present. Um, is there a way of uh, directly correlating? You seem to be indicating that there's a correlation between um, the amount of distortion and the decorrelation of the signal. Yes, so there, there have been um, um, other papers have been published on the, on the matter. There, some people also talk about signal to distortion ratio, SDR. And there have been papers that have been published by Tema and um, I'm drawing a blank, but there, there, there have been more than one attempt at uh, trying to draw a connection between distortion energy and loss of coherence, whether it's intermodulation or harmonic or any of those. But um, in the interest of this standard, yes, when there's distortion, coherence will indicate it. We have a okay. question. We have a question, okay. Leela. 
A question. So we have a question. How would the coherence change with respect to elevation of the mic at close distance? So yeah, so we're gonna, you know, when we work our way through this presentation, we're gonna discover that there's basically two job descriptions. We have one or two microphones, but there are two job descriptions. There's one microphone whose purpose is to obtain the transfer function. And the same microphone or a different one will be ultimately determined to measure the sound level. And, and hopefully you can appreciate that these are could be one and the same. But um, so the microphone whose job description is to obtain the transfer function will typically end up very close to the loudspeaker. And it's not about getting a boutique benchmark measurement. It's about the change in the transfer function that we're trying to capture. So we're not interested in how the transfer function looks. We just want to detect a change in the transfer function. Um, so the standard recommends that the height of the microphone is such that the response is similar as the one that you would see in the, you know, as similar to the best within your abilities as the one that you would obtain in the far field. But you're not looking for a boutique benchmark response, you're looking for a change in the response, either by compression or distortion, as we're about to see later during this presentation. So there's no reason to obsess about the position of the transfer function microphone, other than making sure that you have su sufficient signal to noise and uh, sufficient direct to reverberant. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So what would be a reliable threshold for coherence? Um, so the standard uh, agreed on 91%. And um, of course, there have been uh, people that said, well, you know, you, you would not be surprised that somebody like Floyd Toole, of all people, is of course greatly concerned how that relates to our perception subjectively. But that's not part of the mission statement. That's not part of the charter. Um, we're not here to have a discussion about which flavors of distortion are agreeable or not. Right? This is just uh, a standard that tries to capture the maximum performance of a loudspeaker under linear conditions. Now, that is always a penultimate result. It will never be the end of all because you can exceed that level, but you're also going to venture into the nonlinear range of operation, which may or may not agree with your, your personal taste, but that's not part of the charter here. Right? So it's the, 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 the impetus of this standard is to come up with something to create a situation where we can compare apples to apples and oranges to orange, which we can only do if everybody adheres to the same stop conditions. But that does not mean that whatever number comes out of that procedure is the end and all of it. It's just, it's just the number that you get at the onset of nonlinear operation. And you can exceed that level at your discretion. You might even like it for reasons beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, but the, the, the standard is a consensus standard and the task group members uh, agreed on 91%. And then uh, logarithmic measurement of coherence. Um, no, we did not do logarithmic because if you go logarithmic, um, then um, it becomes very tricky uh, to see the 10% the drop that we're, we're looking for because 100% we're, you know, we're talking about power. So I'm doing this the top of my head, you know, if you have a if you have, if you have if you have one part signal and zero part distortion, you basically have an infinite amount of signal to distortion ratio, right? And now you're looking for a ten percent drop. That's what we're looking at, and a ten percent drop in you know when it comes to power, that's about half a decibel, right? So now if you go to a logarithmic scale, you're looking for a change in the coherence by half a decibel. So you would need to zoom in extremely, which is very impractical, and that's why we prefer to look at it on a linear scale. Excellent. OK, well, if there's no further questions, um, let's move on by looking at the conceptual part of the procedure, because it's, it's very uh, straightforward. The idea is as followed. We have a uh, signal generator, and we have a volume knob that allows us to uh, set the level of the excitation signal. The standard calls that the playback level. And uh, you can imagine, I'll show you an example later, but you can imagine a media player that plays back the test signal with the volume knob on the front panel. And then we have our system under test, which could be a, and, you know, a self-powered loudspeaker. It could also be a loudspeaker with a dedicated amplifier. It could even be a transducer because there's also interest from within the transducer engineering uh, and transducer manufacturer 
uh, vertical. And then we have two microphones, not necessarily two microphones, but we have two job descriptions. I already mentioned this earlier. We have one microphone whose job description is to capture the transfer function. And then once the stop conditions are met, we have a second microphone. Could be one and the same. If you're doing this in a chamber, it could be one and the same. But um, second microphone whose job description is to capture the SPL level, the sound level, um, once the stop conditions has been met. So here you see such a setup. <clears throat> we have a media player. Um, what a media player is, is defined in great detail in the, in the standard because, of course, you can come up with all sorts of ways to do this. The analyzer could play the signal back, but uh, the, the container designation for all the ways that you can play back that file is media player. And the media player has a volume knob, and that means that um, we have a reference signal and we have a microphone. If you turn up the volume knob, the reference becomes louder, the system under test becomes louder, and if the system is linear, you would expect those two to follow in lockstep, right? But if the system under test goes into compression because of loudspeaker protection or whatever reason, uh, then you will start to see a change in the transfer function because your reference keeps uh, gaining market share, but your, your, your loudspeaker or your system under test at one point will say no can do. So now you start to see a change in the transfer function. And once that happens, we have certain stop conditions that we will discuss next. But once those stop conditions are met, we're going to say until here and no further. And then we capture the sound level. So you start at a relatively low level with your, with your stimulus signal where you are confident where that your that your system under test is still within its linear range of operation. So that's a little bit of a judgment call, but we expect audio professionals to be capable of determining where the loudspeaker is comfortably within its linear range of operation. And then you increase the level by 3 dB, and if there's no change in the transfer function, you have just validated that the loudspeaker is still operating within its linear range. Because if there is a change in the transfer function, then clearly it's no longer, output and input are no longer follow each other in lockstep. And that's not just a change in the magnitude response, that's also paying attention to coherence. And I will show you a video example uh, later. However, if there's no change, you're gonna capture that and that will become your target. And then you start continuing to raise the playback level until you actually do see a change in the transfer function at what time the stop conditions have been met. And that brings us to stop conditions. What are we looking for? Well, we're looking for three stop conditions. Either 2 dB of compression over at least two octaves, or 3 dB compression anywhere, even if it's very narrow band, because that's the olive branch to AES2 2012 standard. So 2 dB over two octaves to as much as 3 dB anywhere, or when there's an unacceptable loss of coherence. Because remember, that was the indicator of distortion. And that drop in coherence, when distortion is the only known cause, should take place over an interval, a frequency span of at least one third octave throughout the operating range. If any of those three conditions is met, doesn't matter in which order, but if any of those stop conditions is met, you stop raising the playback level and now you document the sound level. In the interest of a data sheet, you could do that at four meters distance and then reference it back to one meter distance. You could also do it in half space and reference it back to one meter as long as you subtract six to B um, to account for the performance boost that you get under the half space conditions. Um, that would be for your collateral that you want to publish. Uh, you could also do it at one meter directly if you have a, a small enough loudspeaker, obviously, because you have to respect the far field. Um, but you could also uh, do this at uh, a mixed position, front of house position, if you want to validate the performance of an entire sound system. You know the playback level, you've determined that empirically, and you can recall that level and now use your sound level meter at a preferred listening position, as they like to say in cinema, or recommended listening position, to validate does this system actually deliver under linear conditions at the established maximum playback level? And of course, you would not be surprised that 
when those stopping conditions are being discussed that you understand why a consensus standard is called a consensus standard. Because now, among the 70 plus task group members, we need to reach uh, consensus on the, the rules of engagement. And this is an incomplete list of the many things that we spoke about in the past two years, every other two weeks. Of course, there were people that wanted to know about the derivation of the test signal. So that was discussed at great length. And are we allowed to use filters on top of the signal? And the answer is yes. Um, transducer manufacturers are interested in using this, um, but they also want to confine the test signal to the operating range of the uh, device under test. So you are allowed to use filters. Um, what about using it for products that are ready to go to market or, or transducer, as I mentioned before? Well, the, the, the standard allows for both. And then what about the stop conditions? Are we going to go with 2 dB or are we going to go with 3 dB? And that was an interesting discussion because the other intent of this standard is that it should be non-destructive. It should be non-destructive and we expect the loudspeaker, the system under test, to recover afterwards because we're trying to capture performance metrics under linear conditions, uh, like you would use the device in, in situ. So not only should the test be non-destructive, the, the, the product is also expected to recover afterwards because tomorrow you have another show or, or another feature in your, in your exp exhibition space. Um, so that's, that's the 2 dB. Well, and some people said, well, why don't you use 1 dB then? Well, it turns out that 1 dB is too small of a difference to capture repeatedly and reliably. Whereas 3 dB over 2 octaves, that is already becoming tricky in terms of, of uh, being destructive, not to be mistaken for 3 dB anywhere, which is a different topic. That's what AS2 is doing right now. Um, so it's really trying to find that sweet spot um, where you can repeatedly, reliably detect compression without the test becoming destructive using a signal that is a very good approximation of actual program content. And then we talked about this coherence, like we did in this meeting, like, you know, how much percent and what is justifiable and what is not. And then there was even a, a very uh, vivid discussion about, should we also publish weighted results? And apart from Z-weighted uh, results. And I will show you a little bit more about that when we go to the, the section on uh, reporting. So what does the standard ultimately ask you to do? Well, in order to determine that maximum playback level, you're going to increase the drive level. That's to say you're going to raise the excitation signal until you see at least 2 dB of compression over 2 octaves, 3 dB anywhere, or coherence drops below 91% for more than one third octave. Once you've determined that maximum playback level with a microphone that typically lives very close, Remember, it's not about a boutique response, it's about detecting a change in the trans function. Once you've determined that maximum playback level, you're going to recall that playback level, and now you're going to use a sound level meter, and you're going to measure the level at a preferred listening position. And that's what I mentioned before. It could be four meters in an anechoic chamber, reference back to one meter, but it could also be in a cinema at the recommended listening position or in a, in a concert hall at the, at the front of house position to make sure that once the stop conditions have been met, that you have the desired sound level uh, at, at, the, at the mix position. So that's, that's the, um, that is, that is the, 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 the conceptual part of it. Um, so how would an actual measurement look like? Well, over here we see uh, an arbitrary loudspeaker. This is its transfer function uh, for a given playback level. We call that the preliminary playback level. And if I start this video, you will see the fader rise. So the fader sets our playback level. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to validate that we're still within linear range of operation. So now the measurement is actually running. We increase the playback level by 3 dB, and there's no change in the transfer function, neither in the coherence nor in the magnitude. So we capture that. And we call that the compression target curve, which we then offset by 2 dB. So we bump it down by 2 dB. If we now start to continue to raise the drive level, the playback level, then sooner or later, <clears> the <throat> loudspeaker can no longer keep up with 
the input and you will actually start to see a change in the transfer function. By the time the active measurement, which is the black trace, kisses the red trace over two octaves or more, you are seeing 2 dB of compression. And then you would stop raising the playback level, wait for five minutes. And if there's no appreciable change during those five minutes, which could happen due to thermal and whatnot, in which case it would be rinse and repeat, but if there's no appreciable change after five minutes, you can now capture the sound levels and reference them one back to one meter for a data sheet or, or any of the other applications. Um, in this example, we only see a change in the magnitude response, which tells us that there's compression for whatever reason, but we do not see a significant change in the coherence, so there's no distortion. That being said, a stop condition has been met, and that means that we need to stop raising the level and time has come to start documenting the values. And then you want to do a sanity check because the broadband crash factor of M noise, all frequencies included, is 18 decibels. So you want to make sure that your peak minus your average is about 70 to 18 decibels. That's a, just a sanity check. And how would the, you then report that in accordance with the standard? Well, section six of the standard will then tell you that depend, and these are just two numerical examples. Um, don't read too much into it. But what you would then publish in your collateral would be that the maximum linear sound levels in accordance with AES 75 are 126 dBZ, 144 dBZ peak, and the A weighting being a consensus standard, that is a recommendation. Um, it's not mandatory, but uh, you are encouraged to also publish the A weighted sound level. And finally, the drive level, if you will. What was, the, what was the, the, the RMS level at the ingress point of the system under test? In dBV, and you're allowed to put uh, the corresponding voltage between parentheses behind it. That is what you would do for a passive system. Um, if you happen to have a self-powered loudspeaker that uses a digital input, uh, then we see a, a similar numerical example. The only thing that is different is that the reference is now no longer using dBV, but using uh, dB full scale in compliance with AES 17. With this in writing, an audio professional with access to the standard and the same gear should now be able to validate this claim by replicating the results, and if not, calling it out. Um, but hopefully in such a way that is as easy, relatively speaking, as determining the weight of a loudspeaker, which nobody questions. Before I show you an example of a nonlinear loudspeaker, I'm briefly going to pause and offer you the opportunity to ask any questions at this stage. So we see a question, what is used? So uh, yes, five minutes at least. Um, you may be interested that at, you know, at Meyerson, we do this for two hours straight. Why two hours? Because two hours on average is the length of a feature film or, or, or a concert. And so, you know, the, the numbers that we publish, uh, we stand by those numbers and the loudspeaker will recover afterwards after running for two hours straight at that maximum level on the linear condition. Um, but the standard demands at least five minutes. If there is a change due to thermal or whatever other reason, you have to back off, rinse and repeat. Um, any other questions? Okay, then I will finish with uh, an example of a nonlinear loudspeaker um, where you actually see coherence cave first before there is actually an onset of compression in the magnitude response. Um, so I share my screen once more. So again, we're starting at a low level where this loudspeaker is within its linear range of operation. Um, in black, we have the active response. And in red, we have the target compression curve that is offset by 2 dB. Notice that there's a blue line at the top of the screen, which signifies, it denotes the 91% threshold. If we now start to increase the drive level, there will come a moment where coherence starts 
to drop below 91%, telling you, uh, indicating, hey, these frequencies, we see, we detect distortion energy for these frequencies. So by the time our um, playback level lives at minus eight, um, without exception, you will see the coherence drop below 91% for these frequencies, telling you there's distortion energy over here. And if you follow the standard to a T, this is where you would stop driving the level and document, uh, document the, the sound level. Notice that at this playback level, this particular product is already no longer capable of replicating the broadband crest factor of M noise, which is 18 dB. Um, that being said, one of the stop conditions has been met, and this is where you would stop. However, should you choose to ignore the loss of coherence, whereby ignoring the onset of distortion, and just continue to play to, to increase the playback level until you start seeing actual change in the magnitude response, then we would need to raise the level uh, significantly. So let's do that. Let's ignore the coherence loss and let's continue to increase the drive level until we actually see 2 dB of compression for two octaves or more. That's about 8 dB more drive. Um, but notice what coherence is doing. It's basically telling you that the entire high frequency section is now grossly distorting. Um, so that is why it is important to look at your coherence as well because yes, now we have 2 dB of compression but we also have uh, significant distortion throughout the entire uh, high frequency section this would then constitute the beginning of the 5 minute test and then after 5 minutes if there's no change you would document that level this particular level would also not be in compliance with uh, the standard, mind you. It would be that previous level um, where we already started to see coherence loss. That would be uh, a stop condition met, which is uh, at a level that is 8 dB less. Um, so after five minutes, there's no significant change um, if we ignore the distortion. And uh, that means that uh, we could, uh, ignore, you know, it would be ill advised, but if you were to ignore distortion, you would get to make the claim that um, your loudspeaker goes very, very loud, but uh, at this level, it's not even close to being able to fully replicate the broadband crash factor of M noise under linear conditions. So that's an example of a product where you start to see distortion first and compression next, whereas with the other um, product, we saw compression first, preferably without distortion. And uh, these uh, two years worth of work had had some um, interesting ripple effect. There are other standard bodies that are looking into the application of music noise, M noise. Semti is uh, looking into it because they're interested to use it uh, as an in situ validation tool um, to um, validate whether sound systems, install sound systems in cinema, exhibition spaces, post production facilities, and whatnot um, can. Um, attain the sound levels as, as, um, as the industry decided on um, under linear conditions. And then Avixa is looking into including M noise to validate the entire end-to-end -end transmission quality. Because um, you could have a shout box producing M noise and then pick it up with a microphone, go through your mixing console and all the bells and whistles. Uh, if there's non-linear operation due to poor gain staging and whatnot, but if there's, you know, if there's any way in your signal path, if there's non-linear behavior, um, you can detect it um, and start looking into what is causing uh, the distortion. So super rewarding that other standard bodies um, have interest in this as well. Now, for those that are interested in AES standards in general, 
um, this is where you would go. And uh, for those that are interested in a copy of the test signals, um, as we speak, they've also been made available um, through the AES. Uh, you can download a zip archive, which contains both a 96 kilohertz version as well as a 48 kilohertz version of the test signal. And uh, with that, I've come to the, uh, to the end of my presentation, and I'm more than happy to um, answer any questions that you might have at this stage. Questions in general, apart from me? How is reducing HF spectral demand of general program uh, allowed for? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Uh, I can expand. The, the spectral content of your standard program material has less energy at the high frequencies, and therefore you would allow for that in your testing. But you're, allowed, you're assuming a flat spectral response on your measurements, give or take the peak to average ratios you've got everywhere. No, 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 because you're, you're looking at a transfer function. You're not looking at the spectrocon directly. You're looking at the output with respect to the input. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The, the, the transfer function does not reveal the, uh, the, the spectral content of the excitation signal. Um, but again, the, the, how the transfer function looks is secondary. You want the transfer function to look similar as the one that you obtain in the far field. Um, but the transfer function microphone, its sole purpose is to detect a change in the transfer function, whether it's compression or loss of coherence. Understand, but you'll be adding extra energy at high frequencies to uh, get that uniform spectral response, which won't be the case with the source material that you're going to use it in the, in the cinema or wherever it's going to be used. Where does the extra energy come from? Because you've applied a flat spectral response to that. No, the M noise has a M noise. The 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 spectrum of M noise, and that's important that we get that across. Uh, M noise, the the RMS level of M noise rolls off, just as all those other signals. Okay, um, so it is, it is spectrally tailored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but 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 what sets us apart from other program content is that uh, what it sets us apart from other com content is that its peak spectrum no, is I, flat. I, yeah, I understand. Okay, so when you when you're showing that flat response, it's the different signal that is is being constant. The, the the flat response that you see on a transfer function analyzer is the 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 output to input ratio of the device on the test yes, does yes, not so reveal. It's a, so it's a difference. Yeah, but Good. the 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 spectral content of M noise uh, has been shaped yep. just in 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 a, in a similar fashion as the spectral content of all those other test signals. Understood. Um, the only thing that is contested is the amount of low frequency content, but you are allowed to filter. And you, if you read the standard, you will also see that you're allowed to filter. That being said, this should also be eligible for uh, cinema, post-production and whatnot. So if you, if you read the standard, you will see that the lower corner frequency has been chosen to comply with, uh, to comply with um, 702095 and, and the recommended practice 2096. But you are allowed to high pass the signal. Again, going back to the impetus of the standard, an audio professional with access to the same gear should be able to replicate uh, those findings. So it should not come as a surprise that if you decide to use additional filtering, that you're expected to disclose which filters you used. Sure. As part of the standard, um, such that you and I can <clears throat> apply the same filters and say, you know, that manufacturer is uh, publishing uh, plausible numbers. Uh, Graham, could I comment that the um, spectral content that you're talking about is correct for classical music and jazz and the like, but some heavily compressed pop music tends to have a very uniform flat spectral response? Uh, I would have, I mean, Roger was responsible for doing the analysis of the hundreds of tracks that we did, but that being said, you, you need to find uh, some middle ground um, between every possible genre you and I can think of. And you can also see by looking at those other simulated program contents, whether it's IEC or 426B, you, you have to find a middle ground um, that, that, that is a reasonable approximation of 
every possible piece of program content out there. So I'm not I'm not contesting that, but that's the nature of the beast. I have a question. Can I use? Sorry. I have a question regarding when you're doing this non-coherent measurement and there's background noise. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you actually exclude that? In other words, when you, uh, how do you determine the threshold when there is, say, somebody opens a door or, or the air conditioning comes on? Right. So, so the the standard uh, uh, goes at great length to explain that you need at least ten decibels of signal to noise, uh, right. such that you can rule out noise as potential cause for uh, coherence loss, and it also gives you coherence targets that you need to aim for when you're determining your linear playback. Of course, it's if, if somebody turns on the air conditioning during the five minute test and you fail to, um, and you fail to catch that, then you might see a coherence loss, which is not caused by distortion, but by somebody turning on the air conditioning. But that would then be on, I would put the onus on the examinator that is, uh, that is in charge of that. But we okay. like to think that people will conduct these tests in a somewhat controlled environment. Any, any more questions? In the chat, I see. Can I use mNoise for standard response management? Sure, you can. But what 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 do you expect? What do you expect to to find? Because this is this is the this is again the thing, and this goes also a little bit back to to Graham's question. And I might actually have, I might actually have a, a little piece that I can show you, uh, just to underscore what what we're talking about. Um, so. I'm going to show you a transfer function of one and the same loudspeaker. And what I'm going to change is the excitation signal that I use. And we can all agree that all those excitation signals sound vastly different. <laughs> but the transfer function, as long as all frequencies are accounted for, the transfer function will be the same uh, nevertheless. So I'm going to share my screen. And... Um, and let me make sure that I'm also sharing my sound because we want to hear this. Yeah. So that's with white noise, pink noise, red noise, also known as brown noise. So there you see it. Uh, it's also the reason why SIM is called SIM because it stands for Source Independent Measurement. And this is a common, let's say, misunderstanding, which is that as long as all frequencies are accounted for, you will be able to obtain a transfer function, regardless uh, whether you use any of these noise signals or even music for that matter. So. Will I use mNoise for standard response measurement? No, because it will not reveal new information. Uh, the, 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 the voicing of the system, the, the, the seasonal tasting of the system, or just doing the calibration with different noise signals obviously sounds different. We all agree on that, but the transfer function doesn't care. And since we use transfer function analysis to do this kind of work, like calibrating sound systems and whatnot, um, for that application, I would just use pink noise, um, which is pretty much a de facto industry standard. We only use M noise for determining performance metrics, because now I want an excitation signal that is actually a good approximation of actual program content, which pink noise is not for reasons that we discussed before. Is it possible to share your paper that you refer Thank to you, meetings. So, sorry?
Uh, Thank yeah, you, we can, uh, Oh, no, no. Uh, the, okay, okay. Uh, that's all good. Yeah, well, I, we can share those links offline. Um, um, uh, I'm sure that uh, Graham and Peter can have a follow-up email um, link to all the, the publications that went into this. The, the AES publications are already and will be available from the library, but I don't know about the SEMTI and the JASA or the other papers that you've got. Uh, the SEMTI and the IOA, the, the, the Institute of Acoustics, I think that was during sound check, that is, that is, uh, that is open access, and I think the oh, SEMTI okay, is also good. open yeah. access. Where we should be able if, to make them available. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. But but I hope you can appreciate that what's being done here is is quite unprecedented. Um, I'm I'm too young to have a complete recollection of uh, the entire history of pro audio, but it's quite unprecedented that as an industry that we're trying to get to a point where we can actually compare apples to apples. Um, you know, compared to the lighting department or even video, we're we're somewhat of a joke in that regard, right? Because they figured out their ANSI lumen and whatnot, and 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 again. This is, you know, even the numbers that you're going to get through this procedure, I like to think of them as the penultimate result because it's just the level that you can attain under linear conditions. That's not to say that there's not more uh, in the hopper. It's just, you know, when, 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 you, when you exceed that, that linear number, you're, you're moving into the nonlinear operation, which is not a brick wall transition. We're not talking about flat topping or hard clipping in digital, right? We all know that this is a, this is a gradual change, um, but it's just to give you a benchmark level that is actually comparable, um, something that has been frustratingly difficult to do up until now. Is, unless... is, is there an intention to take this one step further and look at the nonlinear properties of loudspeakers or any other system that you put in through the test? And does um, this also apply to other equipment as Apart from loudspeakers. Well, that that is that that you know, if I'm not saying I, I, I that may very well be uh, worth pursuing, and that would then be in the court of a, of another work group. Again, it's not about whether uh, JPEG agrees with you and PNG does not agree with you. We're not talking about which degrees of lossless compression, for example, are acceptable or not. We just want to get uh, an unbiased an unbiased estimate of linear operation. And you could squeeze another three or four or five dBs out of it, and it may meet your, may meet, meet your standards or not. But it's just to get a, a, a baseline, a baseline reference. What is interesting, and this is something that I did not know before um, I started doing standards work for the AES, is that, and that's also why a great amount of detail is being, uh, attention is being paid to the formatting of the document because these documents out of the gate are being formatted such that they are also compliant with the format used by the uh, International Electronics Consortium, IEC. And the reason that we do that is because, turns out, more often than not, um, if you have a kosher standard, which we think we have, that the IEC typically copies it verbatim. And if this gets elevated to the next level, which is uh, too early to determine, but if this gets elevated to the next level, then we have done everything within our power to expedite that process. And if it becomes an IEC standard, that's like really the next, like that would be the, the holy grail in this endeavor. Because yeah. um, AES standards are not mandatory, um, unlike IEC standards, and not subject to legislation and whatnot. Um, but that is, that, is, that is too early to tell. Um, but yeah, fingers crossed. One more week, and then um, and then more? maybe champagne. Have we got any more questions from the field? Yes, uh, could I ask a question of Melon? Um, Melon, regarding is anybody is anybody at all using this standard? Because I know that when I have to uh, rate my maximum SPL. I'm, most people would rate speaker systems at 130 dB, and I find it totally unrealistic when the, the actual, what I consider undistorted level is probably more like 120. But right. in terms of advertising, everybody advertises the speaker system maximum SPL as a rated on program thermal or, or a power rated SPL. Right. So I, I welcome this because 
um, hoping that this can actually differentiate product. But is this right. going to um, And I, I compliment you on what you've done. I think it's wonderful because uh, it's the first time we can actually compare apples and apples. Um, can we can we find some examples of where people have used this? So, so it we, shall, yeah. It, it should not come as a surprise that at Meyer Sound we've been doing this for three years now, um, right. because this this historically comes out of our corner. Um, there are other brands that voluntarily started to incorporate this into their um, data sheets as well. Denley uh, Denley Sound Labs is an example of. Um, um a brand that uses it as well um and of course i'm not at liberty to disclose which manufacturers were part of the task group but what you what you my general so so if i put my toe in the water just looking at the sheer number of loudspeaker manufacturers that are, were represented in the task group is that a lot of people agreed that this is an idea worth pursuing right Maybe two years from now, somebody comes up with an even superior signal. Could very well be. Then we just adopt that signal, but it doesn't affect, you know, that doesn't affect the procedure that we have here because that's the beauty of transfer function analysis, right? Sure. They're, they're not joined at the hip. So for all we know, somebody in two years says, this is even a better approximation of ping noise, and then we just swap it out, right? And, and, and move on. So we, we can sense that a lot of people agree that this is a good idea but there is some reluctance of people adopting it until it's been formalized. Um, so I would not be surprised with it, you know, with the fingers crossed within one week of now, you know, when it gets official and it gets published that during the course of this year, suddenly we will see several manufacturers adopting uh, these numbers now that it's become official, now that it's right. tangible. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not, it's not intended to be a replacement of existing existing collateral. It's just an augmentation, right? Sure. But at least if 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 a manufacturer produces a questionably high number, you can now deduce that that must be under nonlinear conditions, because now you have the M noise figure, which is an X amount of the B, and then you have some number above it, which they are still allowed to publish for whatever reason they feel necessary but you as a user can now deduce well then you know i surmise that i can only reach that level under non-linear uh conditions and if that meets your liking power to you but at least you have that baseline reference okay mark uh the software yeah. that the software that, oh. sorry michael the software that you are using for your demonstrations is that freely available or is it proprietary I used uh, so uh, the software that I showed in my de demonstration, or the software that I used to do the demonstrate uh, to do, to do the presentation. Um, the software that you use to generate the examples. Uh, so I, I the digital audio workstation that I used was Reaper. Yeah. And uh, the the bandbass plugin that I used is uh, is called Engineers Filter, um, but. I just do that to do this Portman's way of demonstrating that press factor for actual program content is not fixed for each octave band. Um, we did the analysis using MATLAB, right? We just- Thank, thank you. I think, I think the simple answer is yes, Rod. Yeah, thank you. Okay. But I, 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 I just, I, I mean, if I have to choose between showing a bunch of MATLAB code or showing you a digital audio workstation with a passband filter and say, this is what's going on. Then, um, I am I am partial to the doing it in a, that way. Thanks, thank you. That means that for those of us who are retired, we can probably do it ourselves. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and and uh, yes. Retired, Rod. Okay, well, Merlin, uh, we probably need to take a few of those questions offline, and if people want to get in touch with whoever they want to get in touch with, that's possible. Uh, but uh, tonight, if anybody can bring in some standards that help both manufacturers and customers alike and give simple, repeatable tests that allow comparisons, then I applaud it. So I really appreciate you coming on tonight and doing that session and explaining to us where we're up to with that and the future looks positive. 
I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time and giving us the presentation. That was that was excellent, and uh, we we really appreciate it here down in Melbourne. Uh, everybody can now turn off their mute and thank Merlin and his support team too, probably for all the time and effort that's being put in and for showing us this tonight. So all join me in thanking Merlin for all of that good work.